Hello and welcome to Equine Science Talk, understanding equine science. Today we're looking at the basic needs of the horse and how they can be best met in domestic situations. At present, scientists identify four areas of basic needs. The first is that horses have access to roughage in the form of hay or grass. The second is free movement. The third is social contact. And finally, there is the need to form partnerships and social bonds. These four needs are considered to be given, and if these are not fulfilled, a horse will suffer. These needs form the basis for animal protection and welfare guidelines and regulations in most countries. So let's have a look at what they mean. Firstly, access to roughage. The horse's digestive system is designed for almost continuous eating. Ideally, horses should have 24-hour access to roughage, but when this isn't possible, it should be available for at least 12 hours, and there should never be more than four hours without. Many domestic horses also receive additional hard feed, and this should be divided into at least three portions distributed across the day. One should also bear in mind that overfeeding can be just as bad as underfeeding and can also cause suffering with painful conditions such as laminitis as well as heart and joint diseases. To get the balance right, there are various things that can help, such as hay nets or hay racks with timer mechanisms that allow feeding times to be shortened or extended. It's also very important that horses have enough space to eat in peace, so when they're kept in groups there should be at least one feeding place per horse. Horses may also get disturbed when feeding in a natural setting, but there they can just move and look for food somewhere else. Next is free movement. In nature, horses are on the move for around 16 hours a day. This is mostly in walk, and there'll be frequent pauses to eat. So, in order to meet this need in domestic horses, we need to make sure there's sufficient space for them to move around freely. Riding, lunging, groundwork and all these types of exercise are no replacement for free movement. Third is social contact. Horses are social animals, and if they're kept in boxes, it's vital they have visual, auditory and olfactory contact to other horses. That's to say they can see, hear and smell the others. Closed boxes are not suitable and should only be used in particular circumstances, such as quarantine. Generally, all horses, regardless of age, breed, sex or type of work, are suited to living in groups. Finally, horses need partnerships and social bonds. It is, of course, a fact that horses don't all get on with each other, and it's crucial to have enough space that horses can keep out of each other's way. If space is limited, it's important to put together groups of horses that get on well with each other. So these four factors form the basic needs. But what happens if they're not fulfilled? What scientific studies have there been on this? There are basically four areas that have been scientifically researched. The first question is whether horses adapt to changes in their management programs. So the first area of research was positive adaptive strategies. That means active changes in the horse's typical behaviors, such as increased aggression, increased eating, or increased contact seeking with other horses or humans. It is important to stress that positive adaptive strategies don't necessarily mean the horses are suffering. The second area was so-called negative adaptive strategies which decrease these typical behaviors and again don't necessarily mean suffering. However, if a horse withdraws completely and falls into a depressive type state, it is clearly unable to cope with the situation it finds itself in and is, of course, suffering. Thirdly, they looked how stress under different types of management could be measured, specifically long-term stress that could cause illness. To establish this, they looked at physiological parameters such as changes in stress hormones, variations in heart rate, and changes in the immune system. Finally, they considered changes in behavior, and this parameter proved to be particularly significant. If horses may develop a behavior pattern that is not typical for horses, this is generally a sign that the horse is suffering. These behaviors include self-harming, for example, biting themselves, or so-called stereotypes or stable vices, such as cribbing, waving or box walking. So a lot of facts and data have been collected, but the question is, how does all this play out in practice? When I go through various different stables, I often see places where, for example, a large amount of hard feed is given, while in others it's very little. What effect does this have on the horse's state of mind, or its stomach, or indeed its teeth? 
A large amount of concentrated hard feed is obviously not compatible with the horse's need for almost constant feeding. But let's start with the psychological effects. There's an expression in German that roughly translates as happiness is a good chew, and it means there's a certain number of times a horse needs to chew to be happy. This is borne out by the figures. A typical riding horse needs to chew about 3,500 times to eat a kilo of hay, and this takes roughly 50 minutes. An average 500 kilo riding horse needs around 10 kilos of hay a day, so 3,500 chews to feel full and contented. If we compare this to oats, for example, a horse can eat a kilo of oats in 10 minutes with only around 800 chews, so there's a big difference. Additionally, without sufficient chewing, the teeth don't get worn down as they should. Hard feed, such as grain, can get caught between the back teeth, and then horses use a smaller grinding motion to loosen it, and this doesn't wear the teeth down in the same way as normal chewing. In a relatively short space of time, the teeth develop sharp points and edges, and so need more frequent rasping. Then there's the effect on the stomach. Insufficient roughage increases the risk of stomach ulcers. This is because less saliva is produced when chewing hard feed than when chewing hay, and the saliva acts as a buffer against the strong stomach acid. And it has actually been shown in scientific studies that a change of feed to include less hay and more hard feed can lead to oral stereotypies, such as cribbing and wind sucking. What about when horses are turned out on pasture? Maybe they're out on the pasture during the day and in the box at night. Will they get enough roughage from the grass? No, generally not. The quality of grass and its nutritional value varies a lot across the year. In any event, if they're stabled at night, they'll still need some hay because no horse should go for longer than four hours without some roughage being available. It is also worth mentioning here that there can also be a risk of sun colic if horses are left on a poor pasture with insufficient roughage. Their digestive system is such that they will continuously look for food and even grab small mouthfuls while they are on the move. If there is not enough quality roughage available in the form of good grass or hay, they start pulling up the roots of the grass and they might eat these together with the sand. However, the risk of sand colic can be minimized if hay or straw is provided. But if there is ad lib hay, there is a risk of overfeeding. So what about the methods of slowing eating down and lengthening the feeding time? How do these impact on the horse's health? Yes, indeed. Hay nets are often used or a mesh or grill might be placed over the hay. The problem here is that the horse may overuse their front teeth. This can damage these teeth and in extreme cases may even lead to the loss of a tooth. Hay nets may also disturb the natural eating rhythm. In nature, horses collect several small bites in their mouths before they start chewing, but hay nets with small holes, where they can only take a small amount at a time, may disrupt this process. I'd also like to stress that every method of increasing the eating time is in some way a compromise. In the natural situation, horses are constantly moving forward, then stopping to eat, moving forward, and then stopping to eat. When we use a hay net or similar, the horse is east and turns around or backs away from the net, takes a few steps and then turns to it again. And it is debated in farrier cycles whether this type of movement causes changes in the hoof. Having said this, there are of course cases where using a hay net to slow eating down may be preferable if the alternative is going for long periods without food. For example, if a horse is overweight or if only hay with high nutritious value such as alfalfa is available. Also, where hay is in short supply or very expensive, hay nets may be chosen to reduce wastage. OK, let's move on from feeding and talk about movement. In urban areas in particular, space is often limited and people sometimes try to compensate for this with an hour or two of turnout on a paddock or field. Is this enough to fulfil the horse's need for movement? Well, as I mentioned before, horses should ideally have around 16 hours of free movement a day. This isn't possible in most domestic situations, but of course just an hour or two doesn't come anywhere near it. Another problem is that these paddocks are usually much too small for the horses to be able to move around properly. However, there are some very creative ideas about how to solve this problem and allow for group turnout with enough free movement, even with limited space. 
These include the so-called paddock paradise or paddock trail system, where one makes a path all around the available space to maximise the movement possibilities. Another creative solution is to use the riding arena for group turnout overnight. Those are certainly interesting ideas, but what about training facilities where horses are constantly coming and going? Is group turnout possible when groups are always changing and new horses would have to be integrated? Surely that increases the stress and risk of injuries? Yes, of course it's possible, but as you say, there is the risk that the horse can be injured. Some facilities manage it, but it must be said that they need to have incredibly large spaces. You need very large fields where horses can get out of each other's way or avoid each other. There must also be enough feeding and resting places, and in fact more than the number of horses, and it needs the right construction that means no narrow spaces and enough entrances and exits to shelters so that horses can't get trapped. And going back to the horse's permanent home facilities, what about paddock boxes where horses can go outside and get fresh air? Paddock boxes are no replacement for free movement. It's like having a room with a view or a balcony. Of course, it's good that they can get more sunshine and fresh air and have more visual stimulations by seeing their surrounding and maybe have more contact to social partners, but that's it. We have to understand that you can't just leave a horse in a paddock box for days and think it has enough exercise. It doesn't. Proper daily turnout is very important and some people insist on it. Whatever the weather. Keep going. Yeah. Everybody go in. That brings us to the topic of social contact, which, as we've already said, is very important to horses. If a horse is kept alone, would a donkey or a mule be suitable company, or maybe even a goat? Yes, a donkey is a possible social partner, but it's not that easy. Different animals have different social structures, and you never get an optimum social contact between different species. You can see here that two donkeys are turned out with horses, but the donkeys and the horses each keep to themselves and very rarely interact. I've seen this myself with a mare that came to us accompanied by a goat. The goat was quickly abandoned as soon as the mare had the, her first ever experience of being in a group of horses. What about horses that are aggressive towards other horses, such as those in neighbouring boxes? Sometimes these horses pull faces at the others and kick the box walls. Do you just have to move them to another box? Exactly that. First, you should try putting the horses in different boxes. And in the case of an aggressive and nervous horse, maybe put it at the end of the row, so that it has a bit of separation from the others. The next step would be to consider enlarging the boxes so that horses can use the middle area of their box without being attacked from both sides. And how about keeping stallions? Many people keep stallions separately, especially in the covering season, but then they don't have social contact. Is there a better solution? Yes, there are some facilities that have found some really great solutions to this problem. They have stallion groups. And this corresponds to the natural situation in which stallions group together in so-called bachelor bands. What we see is that when we make these groups, the stallions show very natural behavior. To start with, it is usually like two men who have had a minor car accident. They each get out of their car and start yelling at each other. Then they get back in their cars and drive on. It's much the same with the stallions. They approach each other, start screaming at each other, and it looks like a terrible fight is going to break out. Then they just turn around and go their own ways. And at the end of the day, nothing happens. Even with stallions that are used for breeding. I've noticed that in open stabling, which supposedly fulfills all the horse's needs, one still sees horses that crib or weave, or show other stable vices. Why is this? Well, open stabling is not necessarily perfect. It still has to fulfill certain criteria, and open stabling can be designed and built in a way that it does not meet the horse's needs. For example, resting places might be badly placed, so that some horses are constantly driven away or moved on by others. 
Even though the horses are kept in groups, some of them might still suffer enormous stress. Here social experience is important. Let's say to put a very insecure horse with very little social experience in an established group, this horse may well suffer a great deal of stress and this type of management might be unsuitable for it. However, if this happens, I would say take this horse and try it in another group before giving up on the idea of group management. In the course of our study, we have often seen cases where a horse was moved to another group and suddenly everything worked out very well and there were no further problems. We should also bear in mind that even the natural setting isn't always perfect. Semi-wild horses have to cope with extremes of weather, poor feeding conditions and less than ideal shelter. But for humans, our responsibility is to provide the best compromise we can for the horses in our care. Always taking the basic needs of roughage, free movement, social contact and social bonds into consideration. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe to the Equine Science Talk channel and check out our other videos. See you again soon.